Well, I got to tell you, I couldn't be more pleased to introduce our, our keynote speaker. Um, he has served as the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County since 1992. He is award-winning educator and consultant on science and math education to national agencies, universities, and school systems. In 2012, President Obama asked Dr. Rabowski to chair the Advisory Commission on Education Excellence for African Americans. On a side note, as a 12-year-old, he marched in the Children's Crusade with the late Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. in, Alabama, in Birmingham, Alabama. He was arrested and jailed for five days. His experience in Birmingham gave him his life's mission, and since, he has been a staunch and tireless campaigner for equity, education, and excellence. Now, on a personal note, when my youngest daughter was willing, deciding where she went to school, and as a parent, I, like most parents, decided I did not want to interfere, I worked very hard to interfere. And I made sure that one of the campuses that she went to was to tour the University of Maryland at Baltimore County. My daughter wisely chose her own way and ended up going there and graduated not only with a, her bachelor's degree, but also a master's degree in art education. Uh, I got to tell you, when you're the Secretary of Health and the phone rings, and as a president of your daughter's school calling, to kind of give you a progress report, you usually pick up the phone and listen. But I got to tell you, th that's not uncommon for this amazing educator. Because every parent who goes to this school has the same story. When he walks down the campus, they all say, Dr. Rabowski, Dr. Rabowski, this guy's a rock star. And it's because he cares because he's an amazing educator, and he's had just an amazing, amazing experience and success at getting underrepresented minorities um, into the sciences. So I want to bring to the stage activist, educator, leader, and my good friend, and my daughter's teacher, <laughs> Dr. Freeman Rabowski. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin. I am honored to be here. I begin with poetry. William Carlos Williams said that it's difficult to find news in poetry, and yet men die miserably, men and women die miserably every day because of a lack of what is found there. I begin with words from our beloved and now late Maya Angelou. Lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands. Mold it into the image of your most public self. Sculpt it into the shape of your most private need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, good afternoon. Good afternoon, APHA. Give her a round of applause for poetry, for poetry. I'm coming from a campus that has students from 150 countries, where about half are in science and engineering, a half in arts and humanities, where we've made health disparities a major, major theme now of the campus, where we're hiring people in the social sciences, looking for good folks interested in positions in the life sciences. And I, I begin with the notion that the way we think about ourselves as a society, as professionals, as human beings, the language that we use, the way we interact with each other, the values that we hold will be so important we become like those things. 
And so I will constantly come back to this notion of our sense of self as a nation, as a society, as people, as a profession. And I, I posit this statement to you. I give you this as a theme of what I'm about to say as you think about health policies across sectors, that you are all educators. You are all leaders. You are experts in your field, and I would argue that you and I together, we have the responsibility of helping the general public, families and children and people in other professions understand that this theme, this notion of public health is not something, a concept for a few, but it must be all pervasive. Give me a hand for the idea of public health being on the minds of everyone, of everyone. And I am coming to you from the perspective of education. Dr. Benjamin talked to me and said he knew I focus on education. And, and what is significant today as you think about health policies that go across disciplines, across sectors, that we see the environment clearly, that we understand that we're talking about education, yeah, but that anyone responsible for any of these social determinants, when you think about everything from transportation to housing to the criminal justice system, I don't know of any part of our society that should not be as concerned about these issues as you are here today. And as many experts, several of my colleagues, faculty members and others, people from my Hilltop Institute at, at UMBC, which is focused on health research and particularly for the Medicaid patients. The fact is that my professors all said, Freeman, make the point over and over again that this country needs to do so much more pre for pre prevention in healthcare to understand just how important prevention is as a theme. Prevention as a theme. It is so important that we find that message somehow. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, the president of Stanford asked a group of American presidents in the past year, how long do you think college students can concentrate in a lecture? When a person is lecturing, how long do you think that that person, that the students can actually concentrate? What do you think? You know, I'm hearing all of you, it's interesting, and the more you have parents or you've been there, the shorter the amount of time you're giving me somehow <laughs> in the audience. Well, the, I mean, the neuroscientists typically say 20 minutes in general, but for college students, we're told it's under 10 minutes. It's about eight minutes, all right? So now when I'm thinking, when I'm back then, I'm on a campus that is focused on academic innovation. We are moving away from lecturing in many class, classes. We're moving to this idea of collaboration, of group work, of interaction, of active learning. And I'm thinking, I've got some great speakers. I heard all the great speakers before me, and they were wonderful. They were just wonderful. But then I'm thinking, my God, they're going to be so bored by the time I get up there. So you are all 20th century learners, so you have a way of looking at me like you're really interested, but I know you're thinking about the next thing you have to do. I know that, all right? I got that. I got that. So I must be both educational and somehow entertaining, and I want to do both. I want to do both, all right? I want to make you laugh, but I also want to make you feel deeply. And so I'm going to do several things in the next 20-some minutes. I want to give you a definition of a word, and that word is culture. Culture. Because I would argue, as I do in my, I have a TED talk on changing the culture of science uh, that, that talks about the fact that we tend to think that most students cannot succeed in science. The majority of students, in fact, of all races, who begin with a major in any of the, the, the science-related areas will leave it within the first year or two. This word culture, Eric Weiner, the author of The Geography of Bliss, says, and he may pronounce it Wiener, he says, culture is the sea we swim in. So pervasive, so all-consuming, that we fail to notice its existence until we step out of it. Isn't that a wonderful definition? The idea that it's all around us, our culture, somehow, that we don't even realize it. And when we think about public health, people tend to segment. People tend to isolate. They think in silos, those people over there. You get my point? And the, what I'm saying to us in this room is that we must become the educators who are able to say to the general public, 
that our culture, we must put light on our culture, we must step out of our culture in order to understand just how connected we are as human beings, how connected people are in policy, in education, in health, in the government, on the public and private sides, that this notion of collaboration must mean that we stop talking about something being somebody else's problem, that we start understanding our healthcare system and this relationship between prevention and treatment, that it's not one or the other, and that people really don't understand how much we can do to support people, especially people who have not had the advantage of education especially people who may be in that bottom quarter of American society as we think about this relationship, for example, between health and education. I was privileged to grow up in, a, in an educated home in Birmingham as a little black child with parents who were teachers. And the book that I wrote on holding fast to dreams that I'm signing today focuses on empowerment of young people, of children and young people, from the civil rights movement to STEM achievement on a campus that focuses on both the sciences and engineering, but also on the arts and the humanities and social sciences. And one of my messages in the book is, when somebody talks about STEM, and I am, I am a mathematician, I get goosebumps doing math. Did you get that? Goosebumps, all right? How many of you here in this room love to read? Let me see your hands. Right, I got it. Now, how many of you love mathematics? It's a pretty nerdy group, not bad, not bad. I'm on a campus that is very nerdy, a uh, place where math rocks, as does Beckett in theater, for example. But I'm on a campus where, quite frankly, the basketball team can read well, they graduate and get good jobs. Give me a big hand for that. Big hand, big hand for that. Very much important. And where we are in the Final Four in chess and game development. So we are that nerdy kind of place. But I want you to think about me as a little black kid growing up in the back of the church one day in the Wednesday night looking at this guy who's talking there because my parents made me go to church in the middle of the week. What kid wants to go to church, right, in the middle of the week? And they placate me with the two things I like most, um, math and eating, all right? And I'm eating these M&Ms, the good kind with the peanuts, and I'm doing math. And all of a sudden, the guy says, if, if our babies participate, if our children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that our children understand the difference between right and wrong. And I, I looked up because I was so tired of those hand-me-down books from the white schools, and, and I was just so just bothered that they didn't think enough of us to give us the schools with more resources. Wonderful teachers, but without the resources. And so I said, who is that guy? And they said, of course, his name was Dr. Martin Luther King. And I listened to him, and I was inspired, and I went home, and I said to my parents, I must go. I was 12 years old, but I said, I've got to go. And they said, absolutely not. <laughs> and I said, you made me go and listen to him. I did. You told me to think carefully about what he said. I did. And now I want to do what he says, and you won't let me. You guys are hypocrites. Now, at that time, you did not tell your parents in the 60s they were hypocrites. You know that, right? You did not tell your parents. They said, boy, go to your room. And, and I, I knew I was in trouble. But the next morning, they came in, and they had not slept. And I could tell they had been crying. And I was really scared. And they said they had prayed all night. And they said, it wasn't that we didn't trust you. We didn't trust your going to jail and being under people because we didn't know how they would treat you. And they said, but we have, we have thought about it, we have prayed over it, and if you want to go, we will put you in God's hands. And they allowed me to go, and it was an empowering experience, a painful experience. The children were tr mistreated, and yet we learned that we could have an impact on our own destiny. Give the idea of empowering youth a round of applause, that children can have an impact on their own destiny. It is so important. It is so important. And as I have said so often, they taught me in so many ways no time to be a victim when I'm working. Our campus is one that has all of these really 
hard-working, high-achieving kids. We learn from kids from other countries, whether it's China, India, or Nigeria, the islands, or Russia, or whatever. And yet, we, we bring in children from Baltimore City, little kids between the ages of 8 and 17 in our choice program for first-time offenders. You talk about public health, and you get a chance to see these children who've not had the, all the things that everybody in this room has had, and you feel their strain and their stress. And at the same time, you see the strength that they have, the strength that they bring, the fact that they can get up in the morning, that they can be resilient, and that they need someone to tell them to believe in them. And so when I'm telling them not to be victims, it's not because I don't understand the world is not fair. It is that we must teach our children to be able to withstand and to have the grit and the resilience while we work to change public policies. We must do both. Give me a hand for the idea of doing both, of doing both. It's so important. But the significance of this is this, that amazingly, amazingly, after that children's march and after a terrible bombing of a church of my little friends and little girls, four little girls in Birmingham, and after a, a, a wonderful things that happened like the March on Washington, before we knew it, we had the Civil Rights Act. And so as we talk about anniversaries today, we the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, but here's the one I want you to talk about and think about because we celebrate the 50th anniversary next week next week of the Higher Education Act of 1965. And let me tell you what's powerful about that message. Let me tell you to watch this. How many of you in this room are either the first to go to college or first generation to go to college? Stand up right now. Stand up if you're first to go to college or the first generation to go to college. Give America a hand for this notion. Give America a hand for this. It's a powerful message. You know, I had friends years ago who were sometimes embarrassed when they were the first. I said, no, you must tell your story as often as possible. Whether you're white, black, Asian, Hispanic, let people know you're the first because what it says is it can be done. Do you know, take a guess at the percent of Americans who had a college degree in 1963 or 64. What do you think? I heard 30%, somebody else. Now, don't, leave, don't let me leave here saying you're risk adverse. Come on in the back, tell me some other guess. 20, 30, 50, if only 10% of Americans had a college degree in 1963, 64, 65. 4% of whites? Seven, oh my God, I heard nine. Somebody, you think a lot of white people, don't you? Amazing. Wait, wait. <laughs> That's a joke. That's a joke. That's a joke. Got to put some humor into this thing. Give me a hand for humor. Give me a hand for humor. Got to have some humor. <laughs> Actually, only 11% of whites. 4% of blacks. Yep, it was about almost three, between two and three percent, mainly graduates of the HBCUs. And what's significant about that is that, so you put it together, you only had literally, you had 11 percent of whites, two to three percent of blacks. We were not even breaking down the other groups at the time. If you, how many of you, I wrote a paper and somebody didn't know why I said this was important. How many of you had not even been born in 1963? Raise your hands. Now, that's disgusting. I want you to know that. That is just disgusting, all right? That is just disgusting. But the point is, back in those days, we just we didn't talk Hispanic, Asian, all that. It was just black and white, right, if you remember. How many of you are old enough to remember when TV was only black and white? Mm-hmm. Yep, 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 yep. And to all my students said, what are you talking about, Doc? TV's always been in color. No, no, it has not. No, it has not. All right, today, what percent of students have... Let's go with races. What percent of whites have a college degree, 25 and older? What would you say? I heard 70 percent. Somebody else? 40. Anybody else? 45. It turns out that we're up to about 37 percent of whites. What percent of blacks? 10. It's up to about 19 percent. What's the fastest growing group in our country? Hispanic. We're up to about 14 percent. What's the highest achieving group in our country academically? That's right. Don't be ashamed to say it. It's the truth. All right. Uh-huh, it's true, uh-huh, uh-huh, wait a minute. And that group is about 55%, but there are some Asian groups that are not doing well. We know that too, right? So we, can, we cannot go just with broad, whether we're talking black, Hispanic, white, because if I look at my black kids who come out of the cities of D.C. or Baltimore versus my black kids whose parents are from Jamaica, there is a difference. We know that, right? That, that we know that in general in America, students who've come from other countries, if you look at the Nobel laureates, you will see many of them grew up in New York. 
in the 20th century from parents from European countries where the parents didn't even speak English well, and yet they went, the kids went to City College, Harvard, right? The poor man's Harvard, it was called, or Brooklyn College. They went on and got the Nobel Prize. Why? A hunger for the knowledge. And intensity, this is what I see with my students, and when I bring my kids who are from, from generations in this country, with kids who come, whether they're from Nigeria or from Russia or from China, and I put them together, it is amazing to see how the differences are there, simply because of values, because of what they've been taught, and, but they can all be inspired by each other. But the key is this, that at that time, we only had 10%. Today, we're talking about literally 30% of Americans in total with college degrees. But for whites, we're talking about two-thirds almost without degrees. We're talking about 80% of blacks, almost 85% uh, of Hispanics, and almost half of Asian population. So my friends of all races will say, Freeman, that could not be true. Everybody I know has a college degree. Duh! Public health officials are around public health officials, right? Uh, lawyers are around lawyers, sociologists are around sociologists, physicians, right? We tend to be around people who are working in areas like our own. So the plumbers, quite frankly, who make more money than any of you all, right? You just don't know them. You're just trying to get one to come to your house and help you with that problem you got, right? So my point is what? That, that quite frankly, we have moved up substantially because of the Higher Education Act and all the literature I was reading on the relationship between education and health. You know this, that if a, somebody has a bachelor's degree, they've got substantially more years of life expectancy. They've got much more opportunity in terms of not having the same challenges at the same level for any number of reasons. And that's the complicated complexity of what we're talking about when you talk about the culture of a society. But for me as an educator, I say to you as experts in public health that we must see ourselves as the same, people who are leading and working to make a difference. My career has been spent trying to figure out how to get more kids of color and then students in general and more women to succeed in math and science because much of what we talk about, we need more people in these STEM areas. It's so important. Do you know? Even in technology, there's been a 50% decline in women majoring in computer science in the last 30 years. Every challenge we face, whether it's in biochemistry or in health science or whatever, the problem is that if you don't focus on the issue, you don't make progress. You've got to focus on the issue. You've got to have that commitment to it. And when I started, when we started at my campus at UMBC, believe it or not, we had never seen a black earn an A in an upper level science course. When I was at the University of Illinois in grad school, and literally the only one looking in my, like me in my classes without any faculty who looked like me, there was only one woman on the faculty in math. And she had a way of looking at me that said, I understand. And she would be supportive of me. So I understood this need to look at underrepresented populations from women to blacks to Hispanics to others to Native Americans to kids from low-income backgrounds. Because the one, even with all the progress we've made in education in this country, from having literally 10% to, to three times that, a third to 30-some percent with college degrees, the one group that has not made the progress, where you still have under a 10% probability of a student going on and graduating from college, is in that bottom quarter quarter income wise we must do more as a democracy to help children at the bottom of our society it is critical that we do that it's absolutely critical you know and at the heart of it, and I want you as public officials, as people in public health to understand that reading skills, when I talk about children doing well in math and science, I start by saying they must learn to read and think well. Because we don't talk about problems in biochemistry, in engineering, in math, in, in accounting, in terms of numbers. We talk about problems in STEM, in language. And you must be able to read the paragraph, understand the relationships among the words in order to go to equations. You get my point? And so whatever one's discipline is, the idea of reading skills, whether it's the humanities and social sciences over the STEM, it's so critical. And in the arts, in all these areas, thinking skills will be important. And this is what I want you to think about. Obviously, the better educated the mother, the better educated that family would be. But we need to have specificity. We've got to help women. We've got to help men of color. Give me a big hand for that idea. Men of color. Big hand. Big hand. Critical that we do that. And, the one, and it, this is what my TED Talk says. It says it takes 
researchers to produce researchers. I would say it takes people in the field to help produce more in the field. I mean, the idea is that we must believe that we as educators have a responsibility to help people who look like ourselves and others who don't to get involved in this work and to become educators. On the cover of my book, you will see a white man. People say, why would you put a white man scientist there rather than somebody else? I said, because the power in science, quite frankly, in America, is still in the hands heavily of white men. That's the truth. As a mathematician, I believe you focus on the truth. But this is the good news. That I am not saying that disparagingly. This is a wonderful white man, like many others, who just needed to know what he could do to make a difference. Now he's the leading producer of blacks who go on to get biochemistry in the country. Give him a big hand for being able to do that. But on the cover of this book is the AIDS virus. We've got a white guy, a black student, and a young woman who's an immigrant from Korea. And they're looking at the HIV virus because this guy in his lab with these students of all races, men and women, has been able to discover two of the parts of that structure that have led to drugs that keep people alive. Big hand for him for doing that. But at the same time, we're working with our students to work in communities through the social sciences, to work on the issue involving behavior and prevention and understanding these challenges. And so this is my message to you, APHA. Whether you're talking about becoming a university that cares about all students and produces students in all disciplines, from the health disparities and the social sciences to people who do go to the other side, or whether you're talking about being a professional in a community, listening to the issues and challenges that children and families face. The most important point for you today is this ineluctable question. Who are you as individuals? Why are you here and why do you do this work? I challenge you to know your own story and to tell your story. I talk about my going to jail with Dr. King, but I didn't tell you my mom and daddy grew up in a little country town, a little country town in Wetumpka and Selma, Alabama. And what's amazing about that is that they always were telling me their stories. My dad would say, son, you're so lucky. You were able to have somebody to take you to school. I had to walk five miles to school every day. I got so tired of my dad telling that story. <laughs> I said, Dad, that's why your feet so big, right? <laughs> to which he responded, boy, don't you get smart with me. But my mama told a story that I've told a thousand times. She said that growing up in Wetumpka, outside of Montgomery, she had a choice as a child of either working in a hot cotton field or working in a wealthy home. And she wanted to see how rich people lived, rich white people. And the significance was that the house where she worked had a library. And mother said the woman was kind enough to allow her to, when she finished her work, to go in there and read and would say, Maggie, take the book home, and when you finish, you can bring it back. And the reading, she said, allowed her to put her life in perspective as a poor little girl of color and to dream about the possibilities to dream about the possibilities and to be able to express herself in language that adults said that's an unusual little girl. And mother grew up and worked her way through college in the 30s and she became a teacher of English. She wanted to help children to be inspired by words and poems. And one of her favorite authors was Zora Neale Hurston who wrote a book entitled Their Eyes Were Watching God. And the book begins, ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing, until the watcher turns his head away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men, and mother would say, and women. And her point, Hearst's point, my mama's point, was that you end up having two groups of people in our society, APHA, people who are blessed like us to get an education, to get a chance to get a job, to take care of our kids, to help be working to help other people's kids. But the question becomes, who would you be if you had not been fortunate to get that education? Where would you be and who would you be? And so I, I want you today, as you, as you go around with your professional friends, as you think about your own lives, to think about that question, who am I and what responsibility do I have to other people. It's something about thinking through who we are and telling our stories that can inspire. You know, at the end of my mama's life, we had brought her from Birmingham, 
why they do eat that fried chicken. We always had that fried chicken he talked about earlier. And all the way up, and, I, you know, and I'm still working on that baked chicken idea, right? Um, brought her up to Baltimore, and she had worried about coming because she said, my church is in Birmingham. We've got churches, Mama, in Baltimore. And Mother was so bright, she was so clever, she could hide the fact that she was developing dementia. You don't want to see your mama developing dementia. And yet one day she said to me, I could tell she did not know who I was, and I was an only child. And she had a look on her face. And she said what people will say when they're familiar, though. Keep on living and you'll know what I'm talking about. She said, I know the end is near. And you don't want to hear your mother say that. And I said, what's important to you? And she gave me what becomes the essence of someone's life when they know they don't have much longer. She said, what's important? Relationships. This is my gift to you, APHA. She said, relationships. She said, my relationship with my God, hold on to your faith. She was trying to keep me strong. She could tell I was having a problem with what she was saying. She said, my relationship with my husband, he's a wonderful man. She'd forgotten my dad had died 20 years before. And then she shocked me. She looked me right in my face and she said, you know, I have a son. And all of a sudden, my thought was, she's about to tell me she had a kid and she's a teenager. She's just not telling me about it. <laughs> so all of a sudden, my grief turns to anger. I'm like my student, TMI. Don't you tell me you got, I got a brother now at this age. Uh-uh. Don't you drop that bomb in my lap and die. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I am not happy. I'm looking at her real evil-like, right? <laughs> and she looks back at me and she says, he's a college president. Thank God she was talking about me, all right? <laughs> but, then, but then she gave me the gift that I give to you with great seriousness. She said, but you know, I now understand that teachers touch eternity through their students. Teachers touch eternity through their students. You are teachers. Every one of you is a teacher. I challenge you to touch the lives of other people. And through your actions and your words, through your face, you will let people know what is important to you and what should be important to them. APHA, I challenge you to watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. But your habits, they become your character. I tell my students, your character has everything to do with who you are, not only when you think people are watching you, but what will you do when your mama's not there? There's your character. So thoughts become words. Words become actions. Actions become habits. Habits become character. Watch your character. It becomes your destiny. Dreams and values. APHA, you are so special, and you can be even better. God bless you all. Thank you. Tell them I'll be signing books, all right? Oh.